So what, the, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to uh, make a brief review and finish up the, uh, the issue of structure that we started last time. And uh, I'll, I'll sort of guide you through what you're going to be doing in the exercise in the second hour. There will be an exercise in the second hour where you'll practice some of this and try to make it make sense to you. And uh, um, that's going to be part of the time that we spend together in here. And then I want to leave some time. You filled out a form, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So we're not going to fill out another form for evaluation. That, that's already there. But I do want to have a discussion with you about uh, the, what you've been learning, what would make it better, what's working best, uh, going forward to the next semester. So we'll spend some time on that uh, before we break for the, uh, for the exercise. So now, uh, you're going to do an exercise where everybody think of themselves as either Claudia on my left side or Don on my right side. And uh, um, uh, I'm just going to review something that we did a little bit too quickly last time to get you ready to do the, uh, the exercise. Uh, let's say that I'm Claudia. So then, uh, Claudia chooses two people in her family of origin. It could be a sibling and a parent, or it could be two parents, or it could be two siblings, it could be grandma. If you recall, we discussed who's in the, fam the nuclear family. It depends on who actually functions as nuclear family. And uh, then, uh, if I'm Claudia, then I'm going to create a central triangle and understand how the triangle works by asking, um, uh, how does my father feel towards me? Do I know how he feels? More positive, more negative? How does it work? And then I'm going to ask, and my mother, or it could be a sibling, but you'll see in the exercise it's going to be A and B. A and B is not me. It's me and two people in the family. So in this case it would be David is A and Caroline is B. And uh, I'm asking how are those relationships? Somebody corrected that all the arrows should be both ways. And uh, um, after I say well that's a relationship and that's a relationship but there's one more relationship in the triangle uh, um, which is their relationship. Now, um, I'm going one step further. I'm talking about my relationship with dad, I'm talking about my relationship with mom, and now I'm wondering how dad relates to my relationship with mom. Right, that's how we started to make Taurus. We started to ask questions that are harder to, you don't have a, so much of a direct uh, answer. And I wonder to myself, when I get closer to mom, does that, how does David relate to that? Or if I get further from mom, how does David relate to that? Right? That's what you're going to be doing now in your family. So start to think about your families. And then, um, how does David feel about my relationship with Caroline? And then, there's this relationship here, which is not my relationship, it's their relationship. The relationship between uh, dad and mom. And I ask myself, how I feel about that relationship. When they get closer, how I feel about it. And when they get further away, how does that relate to me? And then, um, I'm going to ask, when I have a relationship about that relationship, how does dad feel about my relationship to their relationship? Okay. Can, Which you, of, can you repeat that last piece, the yellow arrow? Right, the yellow arrow is, here it is here, it's, uh, um, we asked about what I feel about my relationship, dad's relationship with Caroline, and then we asked, it shows up here, wait, oh, no, sorry, I guess it doesn't show up, but the last line is, when I, let's say dad and mom are having a fight, and I actually, I'm happy when they have a fight, because then I can play them off and I'm going to get to stay out later or not get punished. Or uh, it brings me closer to Caroline when she's further from David, because mom comes to me and says, oh, your father, right? Or dad comes to me and says, oh, your mother. So if, in order to get him to do that, so uh, um, my relationship about uh, um, their relationship is that when it's 
more negative, I'm more positive about that. But now how does David like that? You see, in other words, how does dad think about how I think about their relationship? That's yeah. more confusing, right? When I prefer for them to be further away, does he like that? Or does he find that to be annoying? That well, I find it be annoying. <coughs> what? what? He doesn't know about that. He doesn't know about it? In other words, this is not What family do you live in? What? In other words, mom and dad are away. Right. Claudia is enjoying it. Because she gets both the attention of dad because he talks to her and says, your mom. Right. And mom goes to her and says, dad. Right. You know? So then David would be just as happy to see Claudia be happy when he's fighting with Caroline. In this case. In this case. But you see, it might not be the case. It might be that David would like to find a way to resolve things with Caroline. But because I'm sticking my nose in and pulling him towards me, so he finds that that makes Caroline angry at him more and it makes it harder for him to resolve things with Caroline, right? So he might find it annoying. Are we talking about conscious? Are we talking about conscious? Um, well, um, right. how much of our, of our emotional life, let alone how much of our relational life is conscious. If this, this is our emotional life, it's right up here. It's like, you know, it's a banana peel, or maybe an apple peel, or maybe not a peel at all. In other words, what's conscious about what happens in groups is very little. So what we're doing now is looking at <coughs> things that we haven't necessarily been conscious about, but we're asking questions which bring up consciousness. Now, when you say, is it conscious, uh, the question is, which conscious are you talking about? You see, um, it's easy to think about the unconscious. The unconscious or the non-conscious has two different meanings. And in psychoanalysis, they refer to as unconscious and pre-conscious. But that's a little bit artificial. For us, for our purposes, there are two ways of being non-conscious. One is that I had consciousness of something and I repressed it. Right? I wanted to get that closeness with my father, but it scared me, and so I put it out of my consciousness. That's the Freudian, or the psychoanalytic, unconscious. That's an unconscious that was conscious and is repressed. It got close to consciousness, scared me, and I put it away. In order to become aware of something that I put away, I'm going to have to go through a process that releases some energy of putting it away. Right? Uh, if you recall, we talked about this in the first, uh, the first session as well, but it's always good to review it. So there, you see, when you're talking to somebody and, they s and you say, well, in this dream, who might that be? And they say, uh, oh, no, it couldn't. No, 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 it couldn't be that. So they're putting something away, right? And then when you say, well, what would it cost you to, uh, th th we have a problem with regulation or something? Oh, that's pointing the wrong way? No. Huh? It, it's broiling me. I, oh, no, it's moving. It, it's not, it's moving. We, we have a regulation, see, we have a regulation problem. The regulation problems are, are pre-conscious, they're not suppressed. So, the way to solve group regulation process is when somebody feels that it's too hot, they unplug it. And when somebody feels it's too cold, they replug it. That's, that's what we'll do. So anybody who wants to. Are, are people too warm in this side? Too warm, too cold. It's half too warm, half too cold. How do you feel about my asking about, and how do you feel about my asking them about it? Ah, you see? We're just like a family. So we'll see what happens. Um, so the unconscious that you usually think about is something that's repressed. And that has a reason to be repressed, and you have to get to the reason in order to unrepress it, right? Now, th that's one part of the unconscious. And the other part of the unconscious you, you, is something that I just never became aware of. And that is all of group process, right? Anybody who's dealt with groups, and families are groups, you are aware of very little of what actually is going on in relationships. Because it's, uh, you know, 
because I don't know why, the, the, how to exactly explain it, but that's how it is. In other words, if you're sitting around the table, uh, uh, let's say you sit around a, a seder, you know, with about a dozen people or two dozen people, you're sitting around a you know a seder at Pesach, and you say to yourself when you get up from the table, how much do I know about what really went on across the table and between the table? And, and, you know, 10% at best, right? And if you try to go past that, you go nuts. And you drive everybody else nuts because you're like this. And you're, why did you say that? Why did you kick that way? How come you were looking that? And why did you smile when he was... You know, that's not how relationships are. So we're aware of very little of, uh, of, the, of what goes on in families. So these are the kinds of things that uh, we're not so aware of but they make us a little un anxious not being aware of them. In other words, there are things that we don't know, that, that they're hard to solve. Yeah? I would think that um, understanding group dynamics right. would be easier because you could become aware of them through observation, which you can't necessarily do within yourself. <coughs> you go on. This, no. this, you have another sentence that's just waiting to be said. No, we have to say when <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> what? To be to be a, to be an observer of self is much harder than to just you know look at a group dynamic and observe what's going on. That's what I would. Uh, to be the so question is to be an observer of self is easier is is, is, is harder than being observed of other relationships. Yeah. Well, uh, what sometimes happens, and it's an interesting thing that happens in family therapy, is that uh, one doesn't exclude the other. In other words, what we really do is we kind of go back and forth. In other words, we observe something about ourselves, but what is it we're observing about ourselves? How we're relating to other people in a room. Right? And then if I'm, I'm by myself, I can be observing myself. I'm not going to learn a whole lot about that because it's not happening. Right? So I may be deluding myself. But if I'm in a room with two or three other people and I'm watching myself, I may not be watching them. When I'm watching them, I may not be watching myself. So what you end up doing is sort of to and fro. Right? You go back and forth. And actually, that's, uh, that was uh, first noted by, by Freud who said that, you know, the psychoanalyst uh, doesn't have a, a, a single stance. If you have a single stance, you're going to miss something. You go back and forth. You know, somebody's telling you a dream, and some of the time when they're telling you a dream, you're in your own dreams. You're in your own fantasies. You're in what it brings up to you. And then you go back to what's going on with the person, in and out, back and forth. And it's the same with families. When you see families, you're partly trying to figure out what's happening to you because that will help you, that's real information, but it's not the only information, then you want to use that to go back and see something better about the family. And as you see something additional about the family, oppa, it reminds you of Uncle Harry. And then so for a moment you're thinking about Uncle Harry and so forth, and then you go back to the family and compare what's gone in self-observation to what's happening in the observation. So it's, 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 uh, it's not so much one is easier than the other, it's that one informs the other, one enriches the other, and uh, um, that's what you're starting to learn how to do. It takes a little while. Uh, and that's what the live observations of uh, and so forth, yeah. I want to know, when, let's, let's say you're saying to start thinking about our families. When I'm starting to think about my family, I notice all these things. So is that unconscious or is that conscious that I just had never really noticed them? Or, and, and they were just, uh, they were conscious what I was feeling it's, or doing. Right. You could call it, you could call it not yet conscious. That's what the psychoanalytic term pre-conscious. It, it wasn't ever known, so it wasn't repressed. Like, I, when I think about it, I can understand it quite well. Right, like, oh, exactly. I'm happy about this person, and I'm not happy about that person, and when he does that. Right, like and you'll see that when you're seeing a family, as time goes on, you'll start to see families, you'll see that to make comments about what you're noticing in the room doesn't arouse anxiety because it wasn't repressed. You're not telling people things that they knew and repressed. You're telling people information that they hadn't noticed before. And so a lot of times the family will say, oh, well, that's interesting, or I can make use of that, which would never happen with the repressed unconscious, where somebody says, no, that's not true. In other words, they, what Freud said, they resist it. The resistance is the same as the original repression. I don't want to know that. That's not what happens when you observe relationships. What if it's really not true? Yeah. What's that? What if it's really not true? It's not possible? What, what if it's not really true? When, said, when they say it's not true, that means it's repressed. 
Ah. It's really not true. Uh, that, that's it's an interesting, that, that's the famous discussion that goes on in caricatures of psychoanalysis, where, so, you know, you say, uh, um, look, you want, you know, you, wa you, wanted, you wanted something uh, 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 not so nice with your mother. And the patient says, I didn't. And says, well, you see, you said you didn't. It proves that you did. <laughs> and the person says, but you're not wrong. You say, well, you see, I say that you're wrong. That means that I'm right. That's a, that's a caricature of psychoanalysis. That's not what goes on in any normal uh, uh, therapy room. It does go on in Woody Allen movies, um, but it doesn't go on in real therapy because a therapist is always in doubt. You see, the, the caricature of Freud is that Freud's this know-it-all who has, you know, and, and that, that's, that's the fantasy that many of your clients will have of you, that you're in the room with somebody with x-ray vision. Put it this way, a psychiatrist suffers from that all the time. As soon as you tell somebody that you're a psychiatrist, boom, well, actually, when psychiatrists used to know things, now they just think you're going to give them a pill. But when psychiatrists once used to know things or a psychoanal psychoanalyst, so you would come into the party and that's the end of the party, right? Because <laughs> everybody thinks that you have this x-ray vision and you can just see everything that's going. But I think we all know that we don't have x-ray vision and that we have more doubts than we have certainty. And that's what makes some of us, when we're talking to our clients, begin by saying, I wonder, if you recall that. Because uh, uh, you, all, you, you don't know, right? And so if a person says, no, it's not true, it's not that you say, aha, I know it's true, but you also say, I'm not sure it's not true. The fact that he's saying that it's not true depends how he's saying it. If, see, if something's not true, why would it bother you? But if it really bothers you, I say, don't tell me things like that. They are never true. You say to yourself, hmm. You don't say, aha. You say, hmm. <laughs> hmm is a good thing to say. Aha is a little dangerous. You, you know, after 20 years in, 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 in doing it, you might tend to say, aha. Then you have to catch yourself and say, 20 years isn't enough. That's what we say. After you're doing it 120 years, maybe you'll have an aha. You won't be here to know that. But there's no attempt for someone to say no? What? <laughs> of course there is. But saying yes and saying no are just saying. Right? They're up in the surface, and behind the surface, there's, you know, somebody says, well, you know, that's what you wanted to do with, with your mother. And the, per and the client says, yes, 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 you're absolutely right. That's, I, I recognize that, and I've been thinking about that for years, and I've had dreams, and my previous analyst told me that as well. And you say to yourself, this is not getting anywhere, right? This is a yes that's a no, right? It's trivializing it, it's shrinking it, it's drying it up. So it's a yes. So that's not the issue. In other words, content is a very small part of what really exercises us. So, um, so you see that we've done this exercise, right? And then uh, the next thing we're going to do with the exercise is say, all right, now what would make me know all the answers? And what would make me know all the answers would be what we call the perverse triangle, right? The triangle that's stable, that has one positive and two negatives. Now, is any relationship really one positive and two negatives? That's a zoom out. This is a way of schematizing things. Why would you want to schematize people? Just to help you to understand what on earth is going on in the room, because too many things are going on in the room. So you make a scheme, and you say to yourself the scheme, aha, mm. maybe it's this way. And if it's that way, then we could see how um, dealing with the structure, and this is what you're going to do in your uh, exercise, you're going to say, okay, if we applied hierarchy, let's say that I'm Claudia, and I'm talking about my relationship with Caroline. That's a subsystem, right? Now, Caroline and Claudia cross hierarchical boundaries. So we're going to say, Claudia and Caroline, when Claudia is yelling at Caroline, say, you can't tell me what time to come home, so, um, and how to dress, and you can't tell me anything. So we have uh, a uh, problem in this subsystem, because it's a mother and a daughter. So there should be some element of, uh, the function of the subsystem should include some element of authority, because Car Claudia still needs authority. And Caroline still needs to have some authority. What authority? The authority that Claudia needs, and so forth. So if we were to say, and this is what you'll do in your exercise, um, is the hierarchy working to preserve the function between mother and daughter? Um, 
what is the function of the subsystem and what are the boundaries of the subsystem that make Caroline and Claudia work. For example, when David keeps telling Caroline, listen, sweetheart, leave her alone. She's just an adolescent. <coughs> so he's interfering with the mother-daughter subsystem and making it not work. So that's the exercise that you're going to do. Now I'm going to say a few more words about this and then we're going to uh, uh, talk about the course a little bit and then I want you to have enough time to practice it because when you practice it you'll start to understand it better. If you recall, uh, I th we'll go t to here. This is the important part that uh, is important to remember that uh, the idea of the boundaries of the subsystems is a, is a theoretical mistake. You do not define uh, families based on the boundaries between subsystems. That's what Mnuchin did because he, he, uh, he imported an idea from what we call general <laughs> systems theory. People who want to read about general systems theory and there's this guy named von Bertolanffy you'll never even remember his name, who had this general systems theory. It's a zoom out, but it's a zoom out not of human systems. It's of general systems, and when you deal with human systems that have meanings, it doesn't work. It, it's interesting, but it has a problem with it. And the problem is exactly where Mnuchin said, if there are supposed to be boundaries, so I can characterize the system by whether its boundaries are too rigid, or uh, too, uh, too, too, uh, uh, too open, too, uh, too weak. That sounds a little chauvinist, doesn't it? Too strong, too weak, too strong, too weak. Well, it turns out that that doesn't really characterize a family because both boundaries that are too strong and boundaries that are too weak are two forms of low differentiation. They're not the edges of what needs to be in the middle. There are two forms of low differentiation. Why? Because if the boundaries are too strong, people are not talking to each other. And if the boundaries are too weak, people are not talking to each other, they're swallowing each other, right? They're the same. So in order to have differentiation, in other words, in order to have people engage in co-creation, co-creation happens between individuals who are enough differentiated to be able to co-create. Co-create is not, it's not uh, a merger. We're all the same. Carolyn and Claudia may end up by saying, listen, we're both the same person. We agree about everything. That's not going to solve everything, right? And if they turn their backs and say, we're just not talking to each other, that's not going to get either. So what you, you need to do is get to the point of co-creation and the boundaries are co-created. Right? That's the important point that Mnuchin missed. That a boundary is not a limit, it's just there. Let's do it this way. You, 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 you don't talk, you do talk. And uh, the, the boundaries are co-created in the sense that, um, for example, when you have a subsystem function, let's say between David and Caroline, they're in two different subsystems. They're in a spouse subsystem and a parenting subsystem. And Caroline says, we need to have more authority with, uh, um, uh, with, with Claudia. And David says, um, you're just avoiding closing the bedroom door by talking about Carol. So he's, he's crossing a boundary between the, the, the same two people, but between the function as spouses and the function as parents. And if David and Caroline can say, you know what, let's spend a half an hour discussing how we want to make a, how we want to spend the next week trying to tell, punishing Claudia. We'll decide what we're going to try to do, and then when we're finished, we'll have a cup of coffee and we'll see what else happens, right? So then they have created, they've co-created the boundary between those two subsystems so that they can work and not get in each other's way. Or when, uh, uh, when David and Caroline are talking and Don says, uh, I need help with my homework, so there we are, parents, and they're trying to talk about their relationship, and they co-create it with Don. They say to Don, you know what? We are going to stop for about half an hour, but after half an hour, whatever homework you've done, you've done, and then dad and mom need time for, for themselves, and Don agrees to that. So they haven't set a limit on Don. They've co-created the boundary with him. He agrees to it. He says, yeah, okay, a half an hour. And then at the end of a half an hour, he says, okay, uh, I think I, I know how to do uh, 
uh, partial differential equations well enough, so thank you very much, and uh, uh, I can continue in fourth grade and leave you guys alone. So it's not that they're forcing him to do it. He's doing it, they're co-creating the boundaries. Boundaries that are co-created need functions within subsystems that can function. Yeah? But I think like one point here is that if, he's, if the, the parents tell that to Don, then Don says no. Right. Then, then what happens? Then the, the co-creation becomes a punishment or a or so a consequence of him saying no. Exactly. So it's not co-created because it's forced. No. Because there's a um, punishments. Are punish punishments are not forcing. Purpose. Punishments are applying hierarchy. You know, it's exactly. so that's not co-creation. That's I have to do this because they're my parents and they're going to have any consequences. Well, do, what, do you recall the um, the commander and his soldier? Right. The soldier needs a commander. In other words, when Don says, and they, they say, "Look, you know, if if uh, uh, if uh, um, if you don't do what we tell you, we're going to make the maximum punishment, and you're going to have to close your cell phone for three seconds." Right. And uh, Don says, two seconds." And they say, "Okay, two seconds, but that's the punishment." So they've co-created the punishment. He accepts the punishment. See, the hierarchies work because a hierarchy also is something that both sides need. And let's say he doesn't agree. Or let's say Claudia, how long does the, the <coughs> hierarchy work? Right. Have, have you read the uh, Family Crucible yet? Yeah. I have. Okay, so what happened in the end? Well, I'm saying that they like, ended up talking about their marriage. Because Claudia was distracting them yeah, from. Them the right. But once. She was free from distracting them about the troubled couple's relationship. The hierarchy got settled. In other words, Claudia wasn't the girl who just wanted no authority. She was a girl who was struggling to say, would you guys please get your act together to do some authority that's functional, right? And that involves your separating your spouse system, which is problematic, from your hierarchical, from your uh, executive parenting system, get your parenting system together, when you get your parenting system together, I'll work with you, right? But with a dysfunctional parenting system, I'm going to make trouble until you guys get the idea or bring me to therapy so that I'll bring you to therapy, right? I don't think, I don't think it always works that two sides can co-create and agree on, on a limit just because you can get hierarchies in place. Ah, uh, Elisheva is saying, well, well this, is, uh, this is a Boba Maisa, and it doesn't always work. It could work. Right. It just, it sometimes doesn't, differences are too great. Well, in a family, uh, sometimes differences are, are so great you have to impose it, but when you make that imposition, somebody is accepting the imposition. You see, families usually well, don't great. put each other, yeah, so pa great. families do not put each other in jail. Most of the time. They sometimes close the door and say, stay in your room. When you say, now look, you have to stay in your room now for, uh, for three hours. And, you know, in, in America you say to cool off, but it means to get you out of my face. Uh, um, you have to stay there for three hours. And the kid stays there for three hours. So you can say um, uh, they're forcing it, but it's a family. In other words, when they finally say it in a way that makes sense between the two of them and they're not fighting about it and the kid stays in the room for three hours. Now let's say you're doing family therapy and they say, well, we, you know, we say go to your room for three hours and he's out after five minutes. And then the family therapist, Eli Sheva, says, well then what do you do? Well then what do you do? He said, well we give up. We said, well why would you want to give up? He needs to feel that his parents don't give up. Otherwise, he's going to feel that he has more power than he really is comfortable with. So he keeps inviting you to get it right. And, uh, but do you talk about it? Well, not really, you know. Then uh, I, Dad says, look, you know, I can't stand this anymore. I'm going back to the base medrash. You deal with it. That's what your job is. And uh, the kid says, keep, keep it up that way. I'll be in, uh, in my room for one second. So he's inviting his father to function in the executive system. And when that happens, you have to see it to believe it. And so I, that's what you'll see in your first family session, that when the parents say to the kid, the two of us agree that this is what you're going to do, 
kids sh kids want it. They accept it. I think they want. I mean, I think it, I might, I'm not sure, but I think that maybe the Sheva is getting confused with like a child being like, oh, and you're so bad, and da da da, and you're thinking that is not procreation because he is not accepting it. Right. He's not. He's saying, keeping okay, it. But he wants it. But that's exactly. I think that is maybe where the confusion is. See, it's a fantasy of parents that a child like, doesn't want authority. He wants the authority. He needs it. He needs safety. That is the idea. Now, one thing, what you are saying, which is correct, and we'll get to it you know, later, is does this way of working work for all families? No. It works for families with a certain level of differentiation. In other words, a family that is able to use these instructions and get it together and make the structure work, those are families at immediate, immediate, intermediate level of differentiation and can make it work. Will there be families where it doesn't work? Next semester, that's what we're going to learn about. And then the second year, we're going to talk a whole semester about families that can't work this way. And how do you work with them? But first, learn how to work this way, right? In other words, it works with many families. The idea that it doesn't work with all families, the great secret in Philadelphia is that, you know, Mnuchin made all these tapes and threw out 95% of them because they didn't work, right? And he kept the tapes where it did work. And not only that, but Mnuchin would say to families, listen, all of you have to come, right? Which means that there's a certain level of, they're giving you a certain role, right? And uh, the families that didn't bring all the people, he just said, you're not treatable, which isn't a good idea. But the question is, well, how could you treat them? It's a different... I'll give you just a sort of a brief example. There's a, a classic case of Milton Erickson about uh, creating a secure environment where this, you know, five-year-old was driving his mother crazy. And Erickson said, here's the deal. Take a pillow, and when the kid starts to do that, sit on them. But, you know, bring yourself some coffee and bring yourself some stuff to read and just sit on the kid. And uh, so this mother sat on her kid for about eight hours, and the kid got the idea that uh, what the mother couldn't do with her mouth or her uh, thoughts, she was able to do with her bottom. And uh, after eight hours, the kid had a secure environment. In other words, the kid wanted security, but you know, it, it was so far out of security that th that's what she did. And what happened after that? After these eight hours? The, the family started to function again. In other words, the kid said, okay, okay. <laughs> well, put it this way. No, 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 no. The next time when the kid said, I'm not listening to you, the mother started to reach for a f pillow and the kid said, never mind. <laughs> but th th there's a different kind of co-creation. Uh, two more questions that I want to talk about us. Uh, yeah, and then we'll... What? Would we call that co-creation? Yes, a different kind of co-creation. It's something that makes it possible to continue co-creation, right? Um, you see, um, there is no such thing as authority without somebody who accepts authority. A child who's being sat on for eight hours doesn't have a choice but to accept that authority. Like, what's that child going to do? Well, think, of, think about it. Think about it. Just, just, think of it. just think about it for a minute. Just think about it for a minute. A child who's being sat on is being accept, accepting being sat on because that child needs the mother to start to believe that she can be a, have authority. That's, that's, that's making an assumption. That, uh, that child is fighting, 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 and she's like rocking back and forth, and while he's like banging at her, and then after an hour, right. he's tired. That's, that's not what happened. Body. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened, because you're right that a child who will not accept mother sitting on him is not going to work. So Erickson, who was a genius of intuition, guessed that this was going to work for the mother and the child. And it was a good guess, but this kind of work wouldn't have, wouldn't have helped. And then the one last point, and then we'll... Now let's say that Father... I want to give you a different way of thinking about enmeshment and the cutoff. Let's say that Dad comes home and Mom gives him some soup, and he says, today the soup is good. Today, the soup is good. Now, in an enmeshed family, that has a variety of meanings, a range of meanings that work for this couple. They can both choose a variety of meanings. For example, the soup, today the soup is good, I love you. At the other end of the spectrum is what is this gonna cost me, right? And in the middle there is, I will help you cook next time, it's really very touching. At the other end of the spectrum is, you usually don't bother to make me soup. 
since today the soup is good. At the higher end of the spectrum is, oh, you finally cook like my mother. And at the other end is, I think my mother cooked it, right? <laughs> and in the middle might be something like, uh, today the soap is good, but who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So all of these are within the range of uh, um, what could be. Now, why am I trying to tell you this? Because in the 21st century, it's clear that when somebody says, today the soup is good, it has a range of meanings. It doesn't have one meaning. It has a range of meanings in the, con in the conversation. And the way that the wife takes it is going to end up determining within the range what's going to work. In other words, if I come home and say, today the soup is good, and my wife says, and I love you too, then we're going to be choosing that part of the range. If I come home and say, the soup is good, and she says, um, you're always so suspicious, you always think that the, you know, the credit card is going to show how much the soup cost, then that's what it's going to mean. If it's within the range that operates for that uh, couple, you see? So meanings are not telegraphs. A telegraph, telegraphic communication is I already know what I mean and I send the words and you got to get it right. That's not how people communicate. People communicate in a way in which I say something that could have a variety of meanings within our relationship. And then we start to figure out what it means. In other words, my meaning is determined by the two of us. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Most of human communication is more or less like this, that it's two people that create, that's a co-creation of the meaning. But really, it's the person who said it who, who has the meaning. No. no. So you see, when he said, meaning, so today the soup is good, he's communicating something that could have a variety of meanings. Yeah, this, he has something in mind. He has, he has, he has, has something in mind. We don't know. He has a bunch of things in mind. Now let's say if his, his, his wife says to, you, to, to him, and I love you as well. And he says, that's not what I had in mind. So they're working on what supposedly he has in mind, but they're really working on what they have in mind. In other words, he says, well, actually, I thought that your mother cooked it. And, uh, and, and she says, you know, um, I wish you could give me more credit. So they're working on something, right? I wish you could give me more credit and just say that I could make you good soup because I really want to. And said, well, that hasn't happened before. And she says, well, I just went to my, you know, sixth year of analysis and I figured out that that's what I want to happen. I want you to hear this as, uh, as a statement of affection. And he says, well, I've been waiting for that for six years. How much did the analysis cost us? Oh, it was free. It was at the Family Institute. So, uh, um, well, so uh, you know what? I love you too, right? In other words, so they've negotiated what the meaning is and it's moved. That's a co-creation. Now, uh, it's common for people to misunderstand human communication as if it's telegraphic. It doesn't leave you any room to, to move because the question is, what did you really mean? But what people do in relationships is they create the meaning together within a, a, realm, a range of possibilities. Now this is the range for this particular family, for this particular couple. Now enmeshment will be, one way of looking at enmeshment is that it only can have one meaning. In other words, that when I, you say the soup is good, I know what you mean. And yes, you're telling me that I usually don't bother. And he says, how did you know that? But it actually wasn't the only possibility. It's just that they're stuck with only one possibility. It doesn't give them any room for the range that could happen. That's enmeshment. People read each other's minds. Brian? Really, I'm sorry. Yeah. They really, they, they're correct in reading each other's minds? So what, what does it mean by correct? Possible. Enmeshment is within the realm that's possible, but they only can settle for one, right? And it, do they agree on in the other words, one? she. They agree on the one, so how they're not exactly agreeing, they're stuck in it. In other words, she can't afford to say, ah, you're telling me you love me. She's afraid of that. She can't afford to say, you think that I've, you know, blown the credit card and now I'm paying for it with soup. She can't afford to say anything except, well, you mean to say that yesterday I didn't make soup and tomorrow I'm probably not either. That's what they can agree. And what agree. does he say to that? And he will accept yeah. that too. In other words, the two of them will not say, I'd like it to mean something different. They're both, they they're both they're saying, both stuck because, she, because they're he both said stuck 15 in it. million times already, you never make me food. 
Right. So, and so then she says, oh, I know this meeting is the guy who's making food. food. They both agree. Right. So now we're having a demonstration that you undoubtedly know from your, from your neighbors. And uh, uh, when, when that happens, there's no room to move. You see, they, they know what each other mean. That's not a good thing. Having a possibility of figuring out together what they mean, that's where there's room for co-creation. So enmeshment is where people know exactly what they mean. That's not a good thing. And if it was I love you, was that a good thing? Well, if, if they both agree that it means I love you, then they're not going to come for therapy. So you'll never see those people, <laughs> right? Uh, but if the only thing they could, it could mean, the only thing they could mean would be I love you, and that isn't the only thing that he wants to say, so then they could be stuck with, uh, with something that they can't co-create from. It's already done, right? When the communication is already done, that's in measurement. Well, he knows if he doesn't say I love you, he's not going to get soup again. <laughs> that's your neighbors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, what would, what would the cutoff be? It's not what? Only communication. It's also what? with any behaviors, anything that's done. Anything yes. We attribute. Yes. Exactly. It could be just like, just like that. Now, what does that baby mean? Right? <laughs> now, what we, what we know from infant development, and that's the point, that it goes all through development, is that when a baby starts to do that, mom could say, he's making eyes at me because he loves me. And mom could say, he's bothering me, I want to finish my coffee. Right? And what she takes it to mean is what he's going to end up thinking that it means. In other words, they create it together. So we're all, what's his name? Uh, mayor. mayor. We're all mayor in a certain way. And we're all either making eyes or bothering each other. And how we create it together, that's what communication is about. When there's no room to, to move, it has to be this way. That's in measurement. I just want to show you the last point. What would this engagement be? This engagement would be where um, the, the meaning that she gives it is not within his range. In other words, that's not anything that he could possibly mean. That she takes uh, the soup is good today to mean all you care about is soup and not about me, right? Now, that's not within his range. So she's reading something from outside. So from in the relationship, it's not something they can co-create about because it's not connected to him. One of the things that's not in his particular range, I created this guy, right? So I know his range because I created him. In, in his range, it does not include, thank God there's soup, I, can, I don't have to care about you. I prefer soup to you, so right? she's disengaged, but how is he disengaged? Well, if, if, she, if, if she's reading it outside of what could possibly be, then the two of them are not understanding each other. And what is his range? Like, what would he... His, his range was the range that I showed you. In other words, he could mean any of these things, but not all I care about is soup, right? When she takes it as all you care about is soup, right? You think the soup is good and your wife is miserable. That's, that's, that's how you come home. You say just soup. That's all you care about is soup. That's a couple that's not talking at all because she's taking it outside of the range. Right? If she takes it in the bottom of the range and say, I know that you think that I blew the credit card, um, but that's in his range, they can talk. Right? But if it's outside of the range, that's a, that's a sign of disengagement. Now, you could not take this too seriously. I just made it up. So uh, <laughs> one more question, then I want to talk about us in the class. Yeah. Okay, in functional communication, when a staff says something that could have several meanings, the best thing would be to like ask the meaning, like clarify, what do you mean by that? That's what people do. That's, that, awesome. that's what people do. In other words, he comes home and says, today the soup is good. And she says, uh, oh, uh, you're suspicious. And he says, I wasn't feeling suspicious. And she says, oh, really? What were you feeling? This is science fiction, but it happens in therapy. The therapist helps people, you know, when uh, uh, they have these things. Oh, well, what were you feeling? Well, actually, I thought maybe my mother made the soup. Uh, oh, well, let's talk about your mother. Your mother has been dead for 10 years. And uh, why did you think that she made the soup? Because I miss her so much. Oh, when I make soup that's like your mother's, it makes you miss your mother? So they're having a conversation. Right? So it's not about the credit card, and it is about his... Uh, 
What? What? It's about being present with other person and not being triggered with like you know each other. Say, say, say a little louder. It's about being present with other person and not being in your thoughts and he. he, 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 he precise. In other words, words are words. Words are a vehicle for presence, or not. Right? When words are a vehicle for presence, we don't assume that they mean only one thing. Presence is very general. And so it moves in a certain range and people co-create the meanings that work for them. And so when he comes home and he said, you know, today the soup is good and we just had the conversation that we just described, and he says, you know, that was really very helpful to me. I, you know, I didn't realize how much I miss her. It's, I really miss her soup, but I miss her too. And uh, you've really helped me to understand, you know, science fiction, but maybe it happens to somebody's, in somebody's home every now and then. And people have created something together. He didn't create it, she didn't create it, they created the minis together. And then that presence, you say presence, there's no such thing as presence without presence in the face of another presence. Remember Buber? Presence is not something you do inside your pupic. Presence is something you say, something that you bring to another person. That's what we'll be referred to as saying, uh, saying thou, right? You take your presence over against somebody else's potential presence. One presence makes the other presence uh, uh, possible, and people co-create. That's in a good situation, okay? Okay, now... Well, what's cut off? Oh, cut, cut off is that they have not, they're not talking to each other at all. In other words, so each, how does that happen? How does it happen? Yeah. People are afraid to meet each other. So they just live in their own worlds, right? And says, you know, he, he says the soup is good, and she says all you care about is soup. And that's not him, and she's taking it from her world, and so they're not communicating at all. So it's a result of disengagement? Uh, disengagement is a term that Mnuchin used to talk about uh, uh, people whose backs are to each other. Mm -hmm. And w what we're trying to do here is we say, this engagement to cut off, what we mean is people don't take the risk to create together, to, in, to enter the intersubjective. You see, you see how today the soup is good is intersubjective? See why we talk about it as intersubjective? It's not about the soup. It's about a subjective state that's created between two subjective states. She hears it, he hears it, and they create it together. Okay? So now, um, just for a couple of minutes, uh, I think it's worth our stopping. Uh, turn it off. Turn it off. As they say in the movies, turn it off. Um, right. Um, you're going to do the.